This is FRM Part 1, Book 1, Foundations of Risk Management, and the chapter on Credit Risk Transfer Mechanisms. Now, you guys have heard me say this in previous chapters, and I say this to my children, I say this to my wife, I said this to my parents when they were still alive. Risk management is based on the following. You've got to identify the risks, quantify the risks, and then manage the risks. Now, we've done lots of identifying the risk. We've done even more quantifying the risk. And so in this chapter, we're going to try to figure out how to manage those risks, and in particular, how to transfer those risks to another party. And that's pretty much what these learning out these learning objectives tell us. We're going to compare different types of credit derivatives. We're going to learn how to mitigate or lessen the credit risk. You know, lots of chapters re refer to the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. So we'll go ahead and do that again in this chapter. And then we'll talk about the uh, fascinating world of securitization in the, in the last slide or two. So let's get right to an overview of credit risk management and what the chapter does is it begins you know kind of like with an historical perspective of financial institutions and so what what do financial institutions do and this goes way way back all the way to the beginning of time you know financial institutions they accept deposits you know and those are typically in the short term and then they make loans, and those are typically in the long term. So you've got a promise from the financial institution to provide capital to the suppliers, and then you receive a promise you know, from those people who you are, the financial institution is supplying capital to. So this, of course, brings in some kind of mismanagement, and we're going to call that credit risk. Um, because we have all these loans on the one side of the balance sheet and those individuals or businesses are paying us over time. And on the other side of the balance sheet, we owe people money today. And so there's kind of a mismatch. Um, so the question then becomes, how, how do we manage this credit risk and other risks associated with being a financial institution. And so this is what we're doing. This is that third part of what I said back in the introduction, we're managing the risks. Well, one way is just to accept it, right? And just say, you know what? If it's raining outside, I'm not gonna take an umbrella because I think it's gonna stop. So I'll just accept the risk that if I get soaking wet, well, then that's my problem, right? We can avoid the risk by just staying inside and not uh, and not going to work or going to play uh, in a basketball game or on the golf course or do something fun, right? We can just stay inside or we can reduce the risk by taking an umbrella or wearing our galoshes or we can pay someone else to do the stuff that we were supposed to do outside today. All right, so this is really important. So we can accept the risk, we can avoid it, we can reduce it, or we can transfer it. Now, we're probably not gonna talk about, uh, you know, getting wet in the rain or in the snowstorm. What we're gonna do is look, about, look at the scenarios under which we can pay somebody to take the risk for us. And so, so the focus of this chapter is on credit risk transfer. And we'll start with this broad category of credit derivatives. And so these are derivatives. Remember, a derivative security is just any security whose value is derived from the value of another security. So these credit der derivatives you know, are pretty much designed to transfer credit risk from one party to another party. And this illustration here is, is really, really simple. Let's suppose we're that financial institution in the block down in the bottom of the middle, and we make lots and lots of consumer loans. So we're making loans to small businesses and to medium-sized businesses and maybe even large businesses to entrepreneurs, whoever it is. And so what are we receiving from that consumer loan market? We're receiving a promise to pay over time. Maybe it's three years, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 30 years, maybe it's even 50 years, right? Well, what can happen over that 50 year time period? Boy, those uh, those businesses, they can fail. Right. And so then that risk will then come and sit at our doorstep. 
But what we can do is we can transfer that risk to investors. I mean, look, I'm, I'm just a regular guy, Jim, right? I'm a college professor and, you know, I invest in stocks and bonds. But what's preventing me from investing in a the consumer loan market? Well, I probably don't have several million dollars to lend to the local bakery here in Pennsylvania. But what I could do is if the financial institution chops that loan into small enough parts, I could probably afford to buy into that in terms of 5,000 or 10,000 or $50,000. And so the financial institution then passes that risk off to me. And me as a regular old investor, what is that does great things for me. It diversifies my portfolio. So now I have, I have stocks and I have bonds and now I have consumer loans. And so the value, the value of my credit derivative then depends on not the financial institution, but swing back all the way to that original business. Let's look at some examples here. We'll do all of these credit default swaps, which are really, really cool instruments. Uh, collateralized debt obligations, collateralized loan obligations. Those are pretty much the same kind of a thing. You know, the original, the original asset or the original uh, credit market security is probably a little bit different. And then we'll talk about total return swaps and then a swaption at the end. But the credit deriv derivatives, this is important, are over-the-counter instruments, which means that they are pretty much not standardized as nearly as much as those that are traded on an organized exchange are. Um, but the most important thing here is that uh, in the credit derivative market, what we can do is we can kind of weave our way around the Securities and Exchange Commission regulations. I mean, not completely, right? But we were not subject to all of the rules of the New York Stock Exchange uh, or other organized exchanges. So let's go ahead and swing back to, you know, kind of a discussion that we have regularly about this uh, market crisis in 2007 that ended in 2009. And especially since we're, you know, we always seem to be in, you know, kind of a polling and a political season and an election season, season, you know, lots of politicians are saying things like, oh, oh, those evil derivative markets, they should take all the blame or at least a substantial part of the blame for the crashes back in 2007 and from my perspective you know the blame goes to lots and lots and lots of different individuals and institution and, and entities and there is some irony here because if you go back to remember 2001 we had uh, you know a substantial world and global stock market crisis after September 11th and lots of people, including important people like Alan Greenspan, who's the central banker here back in those days, he made a comment that suggested that the credit derivatives went a long way in helping uh, to prevent even a more disastrous financial crisis in, you know, let's say 2002 or so. And then just six or seven years later, then politicians are kind of blaming credit derivatives. Um, but I am of the opinion after doing lots and lots of reading and lots and lots of research on this item that uh, credit derivatives, you know, they're just kind of a tool. They're a great tool to hedge risk. They're a great tool to transfer risk, which we'll see here in the next couple of minutes. Um, so let's, let's look somewhere else uh, to blame for that uh, stock market and bond market crisis and economic crisis back in 2007. How about a quick illustration of a credit default swap? And before I, before we talk about the details of a CDS, let, let's go ahead and just pretend that we're just our own regular kinds of people here. And what do we do every day? We, we probably, most of us, you know, I'm including myself in here, we get up and we get in our car and we drive to work or we drive to school, wherever it is. Well, what do we do in order to protect that physical asset of our car? Well, here in the United States, we're, we're required to have 
auto insurance. So what we do is that we make regular payments. All right. So erase the bondholder over there in that left block and just put, you know, regular old Jim over there. What do we do? We make regular car payments. You know, I have lots and lots of children, so I cut mine up into four quarterly payments a year. So I make four payments to the insurance company over there. And what does the insurance company promise? They, they make a contingent promise. They say, hey, Jim, if you're a bad driver and you wreck into a telephone pole, we'll help restore the value of your physical asset. Right. And the idea behind auto insurance is that something that we need now, of course, it's something that's required by law, but we need it just in case. That's the nature of that contingent payment up at the top. And we hope that we never have to use it, right? Who wants to be in a car accident? Nobody does. Well, how do we protect a financial asset rather than a physical asset? Well, we do it the same way. So let's look at a credit default swap, all right? So there's the issuer down at the bottom left. And this can be, this could be anybody, right? It could be a municipality, they have credit risk. It could be a corporate bond, they, they have credit risk. It could be a sovereign bond. I mean, most sovereign bonds have some credit risk, right? Probably not a treasury bond, but, uh, and there we are up at the top left, we're the bond holder. And so what do we know? We get regular coupon payments, whether they're fixed or floating. Um, but what we're concerned about here is not those regular coupon payments. We can, we can manage those with, uh, with an interest rate swap. We're forgetting about those here. What we're concerned about is if the issuer defaults on that principal payment, right? That $1,000 per bond at maturity, whether it's five years or 10 years or 50 years. So what can we do? We can pick up the phone and call a swap dealer. And the swap dealer is going to be a financial institution. You know, maybe it's an insurance company. And we'll say to them, hey, look, if we pay you every year, let's just suppose it's yearly, we'll pay you every year. And if the issuer fails to pay us that $1,000, we want you to make that $1,000 payment. So you see how we're transferring the risk so that no matter what happens, we receive our $1,000, whether it's from the issuer or whether it's from the financial institution. And this is how a credit default swap works. And one of the cool things about being in, uh, in higher academics is that uh, I, I teach in a finance trading lab and we have 12 computers that have access to the Bloomberg terminal. So when I teach my students credit default swaps, we can go right into Bloomberg and we can see the price of a credit default swap, which is usually given in basis points. And so, you know, AAA rated bonds are usually, you know, 15 or 20 basis points uh, times the notional principle, whatever that might be. But then, uh, you know, a C rated bond, you know, it might be hundreds of basis points. So it's easy to price these things when you have access to Bloomberg. Here's what the chapter tells you about this here. This is my simple, this is my simple illustration. Here's what the, uh, here's what the chapter tells you. All right, so in a credit default swap, one party makes payments to another party and receives in return the promise of a compensation if a third party, uh, a third party defaults. All right, so this is exactly what is outlined in the chapter, which I do there in those circle points. You know, one of the interesting things about this market is that when these credit default swaps were created, you know, back in the 1990s or so, you know, maybe back in the 1980s, you could find a couple of them. You know, the market was about this big, but now my, my arms aren't even wide enough. I mean, look at this, you know, three and a half trillion dollars. You know, my brain is not uh, advanced enough to even understand what several trillions of dollars is with all those zeros. And these markets include, you know, corporate bonds, uh, sovereign bonds, emerging market bonds, municipal bonds. I mentioned that before. Uh, mortgage-backed securities. And, and really, you know, remember, if I go back here, that swap dealer over there, uh, the swap dealer is probably going to be willing to write a CDS for almost any, any kind of a promise that somebody makes to you. I mean, you could have your neighbor who borrows your John Deere tractor and says, you know what, if I, if I crash your John Deere tractor, I'll, I'll buy you a new one. You could probably go to a financial institution and get a credit default swap based on, based on your neighbor's driving skills out, out in his or her uh, yard. That's a silly example, but uh, you know, uh, probably no one's ever done that, but it could be. 
Uh, boy, what are the advantages here? The text really uh, emphasized this, a shock absorber during a corporate crisis. So if, in fact, a company like, you know, Johnson & Johnson or, or Procter & Gamble, and remember, these are all, these are investment-graded bonds and investment-graded issuers. If they ever go through some kind of a corporate crisis, then the CDS market is way quicker. It's much quicker to realize that crisis than let's say Moody's or Standard & Poor's or Fitch can in terms of the uh, credit rating. This is one thing I learned back in graduate school. You know, my professors called, called this spanning. And so when you throw in some derivatives in there with stocks and bonds, you put all these derivatives in there, then the environment of possible investment opportunities is spanned. You have more choices, right? And so I mean, it makes a lot of sense that there's going to be lots and lots of extra liquidity in, in these markets. And then let's go back to my Bloomberg example, the pricing of these credit default swaps. Wow, there's, I mean, these are prices. These, they trade just like shares of stock, just like bonds. And so you can watch these prices change, you know, on a minute by minute basis. Uh, and so then we have access to evidence or lack of evidence of health in the uh, in, in the financial sector or uh, a financial issuer or any individuals that are out there. Now, one of the disadvantages, and you know, the politicians, uh, they may have a point when they blame a couple of things on the credit default swap market. Let me go back to this illustration here. Notice that in my example, we were the bondholder over here and we actually owned the bond. So we were transferring risk, but I can, I can take that issuer away. And instead of bondholder, I could write just regular old gym investor. And I want to make a bet on the financial future of a particular issuer. So I don't need to be a bondholder to participate in the credit default swap market. In fact, those of you who are readers, I'm an avid reader. You've heard me say this before. Um, the Big Short was a book that I read years and years ago, however many years ago it was, and they made a movie out of it. I never, I never saw the movie, but uh, this is exactly what these dudes in this book uh, were doing. And so let me swing back to the disadvantages. Speculators may increase trading that might result in probably an increase in that premium with respect to a given entity. You know, one of the other things here is that, you know, we go back to the history of our country here in the United States is that, you know, we, we honor contracts. And so a credit default swap contract means that there is a legal and binding document between two parties that can be enforced in the court system. But what the concern here is how to define a default event. So when, when you're reading through this on an exam question, you need to be particularly careful about what is the default event. Is it, is it when Moody's lowers the rating to single C or whether it's in default, whether the coupon payments are in default or whether the company says, you know what, we don't have any money, we're not paying anything. And so it's important to make certain that you know the rules when you sign that contract. And look at that last one here. This is one that concerns me as well and should probably concern you, is that these contracts, they can, right? I'm not saying they are, but they can be abused and manipulated mostly because there's, uh, there's very little evidence that um, participants are willing to, you know, like maybe mark to market every day like they do on the futures exchange. Um, there are some illusory items, and I'll show you that here in just a second, in which you kind of think you might be protected and you may have transferred risk, but the reality is that you may not have. And this is probably what happened back in 2007, is that individuals thought they were protected when, when in fact they weren't. So really, it's, it's the individuals or the businesses or the entities that are to blame, not really, not really the CDS itself. Because if you have a well-defined contract with well-defined terms, then everybody knows the rules. And so here's just a quick example of a couple of different parties that can be in, uh, that can be involved in credit default swaps. And remember that these credit default swaps, you know, they can be sold, right? So we can sell and sell and sell, and we can buy from this person, we can buy from that person or that business or that entity. And so look over on the far left there. There's the reference entity, and there is the bond holder who's trying to buy protection. 
And so that protection buyer then goes to the CDS market. Uh, that's that's entity C. And then maybe entity C goes to entity D and then goes to entity E. And, you know, you I mean, you could go all the way out to F and G and H and all, all those different kinds of letters. And so, you know, you look that last one out there, entity E is probably the entity that bears the ultimate risk. And so if the notional of B and C and D are not all identical, and then there's E out there at the end who sums all these and it gets to be some bigger number. And there's the ultimate risk bearer in, in entity E that those B and C and D, they, they might not be protected. Even if, even if that protection seller all the way is one of those uh, specialized insurance companies, what do we call them? The monoline insurers. All right, let's move on to CDOs, so collateralized debt obligations. These are, these are debt obligations, so look in the box there. So we've got bonds, we have bank loans, we have mortgages and non-mortgage-backed securities, so we'll call those structured products. And then we can even throw credit default swaps in there. And so what happens is that a financial institution probably could be involved in all of those things, right? All of those activities. So let's think of that as a diversified portfolio of all of these financial securities. And what you can do, what financial institutions can do is grab these and throw them into one security. And that security is called a collateralized debt obligation. And then someone like me, regular old Jim, can invest in this collateralized debt obligation. So now I have now I have a uh, now I have an investment in bonds. I have an investment in stocks, and now I have an investment in all these other things. So that helps me as a regular investor span my financial environment. Now, typically what happens is that the financial institution will grab here. Let me go back here. will grab some of these bonds or bank loans or mortgage or non mortgage backed securities, grab all those and put them in a pool. You know, I always think of them as um, as a wheelbarrow. So they throw them into the wheelbarrow. Right. And they're they're very similar. Right. You know, let's just say corporate bonds. So they're probably a wheelbarrow full of investment grade bonds. And then there can be a wheelbarrow full of local small business loans and then another wheelbarrow and a bunch of these wheelbarrows. And so you form these portfolios or pools of securities. Now, the easiest thing is to create a different kind of an ownership vehicle, like a special purpose vehicle or a special purpose entity. This is what got uh, Enron in big trouble back in the late 1990s. But you create this entity, right, this special purpose vehicle, and you throw all these assets, these financial securities that are in the wheelbarrow in there. And so you create it. And then what you do is you just sell the cash flows from those securities inside of the special purpose vehicle to investors out there. Now, these investors, I mean, it could be regular old Jim, but it's probably going to be some kind of an institutional investor like a pension fund or an endowment. What they do, and this is really cool, they divide them into different slices. And the French word for slice is tranche. So you have a senior tranche and a mezzanine tranche and then some kind of a junior tranche. And so those upper level tranches are rated. The last tranche is not rated mostly because it's looked at as kind of like an equity security. So those first ones are more like debt securities. So they're rated by Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and Fitch. And so I have another illustration here about the cash flows. And so what you can do as an institutional investor is you can buy into, here, let me just go back here really quickly. You can buy into any one of those tranches. And it doesn't have to be just three. I mean, it could be a hundred, it could be a thousand. I mean, that probably sounds like too many, but you know, there could be five or six of those different tranches. And what happens is those cash flows come in and the senior tranche gets those first cash flows. And remember, you know, some of these securities, let me go back here. You know, some of these securities, like a, like a mortgage, you know, what do people do? They, they move, right? So they pay off their mortgage early or they refinance. So with mortgages, you've got 
you've got uh, people making the interest in principal payments, right? The amortized loan, but then you also have some individuals and and uh, and businesses who who prepay. You know, so that's what that senior or first tranche is. They get all of those payments and they can be structured almost any way you want them. And that's why it's called that's why it's called this waterfall here. So, you know, you think about it. These are the first to receive cash. So they have the least amount of risk. So it's, of course, going to have the lowest interest rate. And then once that senior tranche is paid off, you know, let's just suppose it's ten dollars. So you get a dollar in interest and another dollar in interest. And then somebody pays off three dollars of their principal amount. And then as soon as it hits ten, then that senior tranche goes away. Right. So those senior tranche holders there, they receive their interest in their principal. So they're now out and then it flows down to the mezzanine and then that last tranche down there. And so, you know, probably the important thing is to remember this as a waterfall. And so as you move down, you know, you think about yourself, if you're at the top, Top, you know, you can you can kind of casually lean over and maybe drink the water and wash your hair uh, and you probably won't won't get hurt. But if you're way at the bottom, you know, think of yourself at Niagara Falls. If you're way at the bottom and you try to wash your hair, or get a drink, you know, you get uh, smashed. So, of course, think about the risk level as you move down the waterfall. How about some advantages and disadvantages? Uh, boy, look at this. When used responsibly, this goes all the way back to what I was saying in the beginning. When used responsibly, so know the details of the contract. They're excellent financial tools that can increase the availability and flow of credit in the economy. Look at this. They free up more funds for the financial institution. Of course, this is what the financial institution wants, is to receive all that capital early so then they can lend it out to other customers. Right. So this is affecting the supply of capital. And then the coolest thing about these is that, you know, you've got the different tranches. So there's a tranche for everybody. You know, it's like, you know, going to the movies these days here in the United States, you know, movie theater in the old days when I was in grade school and high school, there was either one movie showing or two movies showing. And now you go there and there's a hundred movies showing. So there's something for everybody. And that's the way it is with these tranches. And the final advantage, I really like this one, is that you can take these illiquid securities like an investment in the local bakery, right? And then you can combine that with investments in other small businesses that have similar risk levels, and then you can turn it into something that's highly liquid. Now, of course, marginal costs and marginal benefits, it comes with some disadvantages here. What can happen is that financial institutions can be less diligent in performing their credit risk analysis. They can say something like, oh, I can lend to any bakery out there because I know I can get my money back quickly if I put it into a wheelbarrow and sell it to those investors over there. Now, I said this earlier, look at that first block point. A collateralized loan obligation is similar to a collateralized debt obligation, except the underlying debt is a company loan. All right, and so this thing, uh, this thing works uh, virtually identically to a CDO, and they have the waterfall and the similar advantages and disadvantages. Let's go ahead and look at a, a total return swap. These things are these things are really really cool. Uh, notice that first block point where it, two parties exchange credit and market risks. Let me just give you a quick example here before we get into that illustration. Let's suppose that I'm Jim, I'm a regular investor and you are Jane and, and you're a regular investor and we meet on the street and I say, you know what? I think the New York Stock Exchange composite index is going to outperform the NASDAQ composite index over the next five years. And you look at me and you scratch your head and you say, you know what, Jim, you're, you're, you're not very smart. The NASDAQ is going to dominate the New York Stock Exchange. So how can we make a bet on that? I mean, we could go to those exchanges and we could buy all those shares of stock, but it would take lots and lots of capital. But we could engage in a total return swap. We could say, all right, let's pick a notional principle, $10 million. So we both put up a fictional $10 million. And whatever the return on those two markets is, that's that's what we swap. So if the, uh, you know, if the if the New York Stock Exchange returns 10 percent during a quarter and the Nasdaq returns 5 percent, that means that, hey, I think that 
the New York Stock Exchange was going to dominate you and I win. So you have to pay me the difference of the between 10 and 5, right? You had 5% return. So what's 5% of $10 million. So look, you have to pay me, boy, several million dollars at the end. So you see how we're betting. We're not really participating. We're not really participating in the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ Exchange, but we're making a bet on it. And that's really what a total return swap is. And the cool thing about these animals is that you can swap anything. You could really swap almost anything. All right, so here we are over here on the left-hand column. Uh, we're just a bank, right? And there are lots and lots of borrowers out there. So we make a loan to the borrowers, and those borrowers, they promise to pay us interest. All right, so what we can do is we can swap those fixed payments. So let's suppose we're getting the interest payments, and they're fixed. So we take those, and we send them over to somebody else, right? And what do we demand in return? Well, let's demand... Uh, a variable rate. Let's just call it LIBOR here, although LIBOR may be going away permanently uh, sometime soon. You know, so all we're doing here is we're transferring risk. We're paying the fixed rate because that's what we get from our borrowers, right? We're paying the fixed rate and we receive the floating rate. So what are we betting on? We're betting that interest rates go up. All right, so there's a combination of credit and market risks because we can arrange this total return swap so that not only do we make those fixed interest payments, but, but we're going to make the capital gains. And then we're going to do just the opposite there. Boy, that's really, really cool stuff. Remember, though, these, these swaps, they're all based on the notional principle. So you can have a notional principle of a million dollars or or you can have a notional principle of 10 million or 100 million dollars. I always tell my students, look, if you can get in a time machine, go one week in advance and find out some interest rate and then come back and tell me so I know what the interest rate is going to be a week from now. And then I'm not going to buy stocks. I'm not going to buy bonds. I'm not going to even buy options. I'm going to the total return swap market. And I'm going to say to the financial institution, I would like a trillion dollar swap contract. Uh, what are the advantages here? So we can derive economic benefit of owning the asset without actually put, having to put up the $10 million. Ah, so this is really, really preferred for hedge funds and for these special purpose vehicles so that you don't have to have ownership of all of these things, but you can kind of pretend that you do. But like most contracts, whenever you sign a contract, swap contract, I promise to pay and then I promise to receive, there's going to be interest rate risk and there's going to be counterparty risk. And that's what I said back in this example here. Look, what happens What happens if interest rates, what if LIBOR goes to zero? Or what if LIBOR goes to a minus 5%? Well, then we're in big, big trouble. So we've got the interest rate risk, and then we have counterparty risk. Let's suppose LIBOR goes up to 40% or 50% or 100%. We multiply that by, what did I say earlier, 10 million. Or in my example, multiply it by a trillion dollars. When we show up at the door of that counterparty, that swap dealer, and that swap dealer owes us, oh, you know, let's just pick a number. Let's go with my trillion dollars. And let's suppose that that financial institution owes me, uh, let's say $500 billion, right? In some extreme example, that swap dealer is probably going to run away from me and say, you know what, Jim, I don't ever want to see you again. I'll see you in court if I have to. Oh, how about a credit default swap option? All right. So in all the swap markets, whether it's a a total return swap or a plain interest rate swap or a credit default swap, uh, investors can buy an option. Oh my gosh, these are so cool. So what does it tell us here? It gives us the right, but not the obligation to either buy or sell protection. So these are either payer swaptions or receiver swaptions. So why why does the uh, why does the receiver swaption you know the receiver swaption they they want to receive those premiums right and so this is what happened back in two thousand and six and two thousand and seven is that these financial institutions oh let me just pick one off, off the top of my hat uh, AIG was receiving all these premiums now now these were in credit default swaps they were receiving these premium payments regularly and they thought it was free money, right? How in the world is a mortgage-backed security going to default? Well, the same thing holds true here. Now, remember, these swaptions, the right but not the obligation, you know, they work just like a call option and just like a put option. And so why do 
the writers of options write options? Well, they do it to generate a premium so they can take those premiums and then invest it somewhere else. Well, the same thing holds true here. But these things are even more risky because of the nature of the notional principle that reference amount. All right, we can end this slide deck re really with some simple stuff here. You know, what are some risk mitigation techniques? You know, these things look an awful lot like insurance. Um, and then we're going to net, net the payments. Of course, if I owe you $10 and you owe me $3, I'm not going to track you down and pay you 10. And then you have to track me down and pay me three. We'll, we'll just, uh, we'll just do the netting. You know, one of the great, uh, lectures that I give in my investments in my derivative securities class is the whole marking to market and margin class where I show the students how this works and I always refer them. And I know I've used this example before. If you want to have some fun in learning about marking to market, go watch Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd in Trading Places. And at the end, when Mortimer and Randolph Duke lose all their money, the uh, the dude from the exchange comes and says, you owe us $392 million, marking to market uh, and, and daily settlement. So look at that first circle point. It avoids the accumulation of large losses over time. Of course, those large losses occurred uh, in the afternoon trading of orange juice futures contracts in, in that movie. Uh, and then, of course, you can just simply terminate the contract, which allows us to unwind. And this is why liquidity is so important, because uh, whether we're in the regular old swap market or in the swaption market, you know, we can uh, we can just terminate the contract and unwind it. But the cool thing about this is, remember, I said to you, be careful about the terms of the contract. And so, you know, it's probably not the case where you can get out of it under any circumstances. There are trigger clauses like a downgrade or le leverage or you know, some kind of performance like you know, maybe a return on equity or something like that. And so what that does is that instead of, or in addition to marking to market, but probably instead of, you, know, you can get out of the contract. Now, securitization is really a cool process that goes back you know, decades. What we're doing is transferring ownership of assets from the original owners to, to some kind of a special purpose vehicle so that that entity in itself can issue securities. Uh, investors to have more direct legal claims, right? That, that uh, wheelbarrow. And the great thing, I've said this before, is that it allows investors to match their risk and return. And don't forget about duration too, maturity needs. I haven't mentioned that yet, but that's really important in looking at that waterfall structure. You know, it's, you know, it's a tough thing to figure out what the duration of, you know, one of those mezzanine levels of a mortgage-backed security is, a derivative on a mortgage-backed security. So, uh, you know, you give investors a chance to try to match their duration needs. Um, yeah, there's liquidity, privatized public assets for uh, municipalities <clears throat> or even federal governments. And then that issue or rating has little relevance, still some. And so here's a, just a quick example of the two main parties of securitization. So you have the original, uh, think about that wheelbarrow, the original owns that pool of assets and then subsequently sells them to the issuer. And then there's that special purpose vehicle. And then there's a whole bunch of third parties. And that takes us through uh, this chapter on credit risk transfer mechanisms. <laughs> that was fun for me.